welcome to today's session today we will start with introduction to structural design there are various stages of structural design which includes planning load estimation analysis and then the member design this lecture primarily deals with the planning aspects this includes how to position a column or how to span a slab so let's get started with the lecture let's see the principal elements of design slabs these are used to cover the large area beams to support walls and slabs columns to support beams and footings to distribute the concentrated loads over large area of supporting soil i have already discussed a little about structural planning this includes column positioning and orientation beam positioning spanning of slabs planning of stairs and selection of footing type so let's start with column positioning generally walls are supported over beams and the primary function of column is to support those beams so as far as possible column should be placed at or near the corners or at the intersection of walls there might be some issues regarding the property restrictions because footing construction needs some extra space beyond property line and hence in such situations column can be shifted inside along the perpendicular wall called as cross wall and bracketing can be provided to support those walls now let's see the structural criteria of finalizing the spacing between the columns center to center distance between two columns governs the span of the beam above them as the spacing increases span of the beam also increases if span increases depth of beam needs to be increased which automatically increases the self weight of member also we know that design of beam is governed by the movement and movement varies as square of the span length hence higher the span length higher will be the design movement and hence larger will be the section another aspect for keeping span to be smallest is serviceability criteria the deflection varies cubically with l by d ratio for larger spans if we wish to keep the deflection minimum the depth of beam needs to be increased by doing so we may affect the headroom clearance and aesthetics of the structure hence one must try to keep the span as short as possible we know that with increase in load cross section of column increases but as a thumb rule it can be concluded the cost of per unit length of beam increases more rapidly with increasing span length as compared to columns and hence it is always preferred to go for continuous system instead of simply supported system to begin with some starting point following table can be used as maximum limiting value for span of beam for live loads up to 4 kN per meter square if we go for flanged beams the limiting value is little higher than the rectangular beams in some public places such as convocation halls auditoriums theaters we need larger clearances in such cases we can increase spacing between columns because in this case maximum usable space and minimum obstructing vision is the primary criteria next is orientation of columns for effective load transfer from walls to beams and from beams to columns it is recommended that width of column should be at least equal to width of beam from aesthetics point of view it is also recommended that one should keep the width of column equal to wall thickness so that there will not be any offsets in the working area and one can get maximum floor space but doing so it is required that the other dimension should be increased such that the column will be capable of carrying the design loads when the column is rigidly connected to beams at right angles additional movements are generated along with the axial loads in such situations orientation should be kept such that the depth of column is perpendicular to the axis of bending so as to get 
the larger restraining capacity. Another advantage of doing so is that in addition to higher restraining capacity, it will also have the higher stiffness and hence larger movement will be transferred to the column. Mostly 150 mm thick walls are used in buildings. So it is preferred to use 150 mm wide columns to match with thickness of wall. This can be effectively achieved for higher stories. But for ground floors due to heavy loads, 150 mm will not be sufficient. Hence, L-shaped columns at corners and T-shaped columns at wall intersections can be used. Next is positioning of beams. The primary principle of design is to transfer the loads to foundation in the shortest possible way. Generally, beams are positioned under the walls or below the concentrated heavy loads. Primary function of beams is to support slabs. Therefore, the spacing of beams is governed by the maximum span of slab. Among all the structural components, slab has the highest volume to load ratio and hence thickness of slab is required to be kept minimum. Similar to beams, as a starting point, maximum limiting span for slabs for live loads less than 5 kN per meter square are tabulated in the table shown. Next is spanning of slabs. Many times we learnt that if the supports are only on opposite sides or only in one direction then it is one way slab and if the slab is supported in two orthogonal directions then it is a two way slab. But the two way action of slab does not depend only on the manner it is supported but also on the aspect ratio ly by lx and the ratio of reinforcements in the two directions. Therefore, the designer is free to decide whether the slab should be designed as one way or two way. A slab acts as a two way slab when the aspect ratio is less than two. When aspect ratio is greater than two, it is designed as one way slab because in that case one way action is predominant. However, in practice the slab is designed as two way only when the aspect ratio is less than 1.5. If we see the economy aspect then the two way slab is found to be more economical than one way slab. This is because in two way slab steel along both the directions acts as main steel and it effectively transfers the load to all the four supports. In one way slab, main steel is provided along the short span only and the load is transferred to two opposite supports. The steel along the span acts as a distribution steel and is not designed for transferring the load. But this is advantageous specifically for larger spans, generally greater than 3 meters and for live loads greater than 3 kN per meter square. For short spans and light loads, steel required for two-way slab does not differ much from the one-way slab because of minimum percentage of steel criteria. A slab having supports on all sides but having the aspect ratio less than two can also be designed as one-way spanning across short span by providing main steel along the shorter span and only the distribution steel along the longer span. As per elastic theory, if we are providing the main steel along the shorter span and the distribution steel along the longer span, then the stiffness of slab in shorter span direction is much more as compared to the longer direction. According to principle of elastic theory, load distribution occurs depending on the stiffness and hence the major load is transferred along the stiffer short span. And the slabs behaves as one way slab. If we see the yield line theory, then as per this theory, the load distribution depends on the ultimate movement capacities. If we provide much more steel in shorter direction than the longer direction, then MUX will be higher than MUY and the slab acts as one way slab. But additionally, we need to provide top reinforcement near the supported edges. This is because the slab is supported over shorter edge and 
there is tendency of load on slab to get transferred to the nearer support which causes tension at the top if we do not provide top reinforcement then a crack may develop and may run through the depth of slab therefore minimum steel should be provided at top to avoid this cracking spanning of slabs is also decided depending on the spanning of the adjacent slab so as to ensure the proper continuity if slab s1 is to be designed as a continuous slab over support ab then it is necessary that slab s2 also spans across ab if s2 is designed as one way slab spanning parallel to ab then s1 will not get enough fixity and continuity over ab in such situation even if full steel is provided at top across ab to cater support movement then the beam ab would simply rotate in the absence of any balancing load coming from s2 and s1 will simply acts as freely supported on ab another question arises what type of slab should be selected whether to go for cantilever slab or a simply supported slab or a continuous slab one thing should be kept in mind that the maximum bending moment in cantilever slab will be approximately equals to four times the maximum bending moment in simply supported slab similarly the bending moment in cantilever slab will be approximately six times the maximum bending moment in continuous slab if we see according to deflections the deflection of a cantilever slab will be approximately 10 times the deflection of a simply supported slab so while deciding the type of slab this fact should be kept in mind next is spanning of balcony slabs in case of balcony economic spanning is governed by the ratio of longitudinal span to transverse span for isolated single balcony s1 if transverse beams are available at ends and the ratio is less than 2 then it will be economical to design the slab as simply supported spanning longitudinally across the transverse end beams instead of cantilever slab if the width of balcony is larger and the transverse beams de and fg are available at ends even longitudinal beam ef can be provided along the free edge below the parapet wall and slab s1 could be made to span across the floor beam dg in case of balcony s3 which does not extend over complete length of room transverse beam could be made available at ab by extending the beam cb but it would not be available along jk as there is no floor beam inside in line with it in such case the slab will have to be designed as cantilever slab because if we provide secondary beam at jk it will induce torsion in beam bh while designing any slab to be cantilever it is of utmost importance to check whether the adequate anchorage is available or not for example if a cantilever canopy slab s1 is to be provided outside the entrance instead of column supported porch and that to a different level that is level lower than the level of floor beam ab then adequate anchorage will not be available because slab s1 cannot be extended inside the hall in such a case ab will either be required to be made very deep and canopy slab is connected to its bottom or else a separate beam will have to be provided below ab at a level s1 but in both cases these supporting beam will be subjected to torsional movement another common problem in case of balconies is that of a corner balcony balcony s3 if balconies s1 and s2 are both spanning longitudinally across the transverse beams ab and ad corner slab s3 can just be overhanging extension of slab s1 and s2 with load shared equally in both directions this is one of the most economical solution however if both s1 and s2 are cantilever balconies 
with no beams at AB and AD, then corner slab S3 will not get any support other than S1 and S2 which themselves are elastic cantilever. Transferring the load of S3 on S1 and S2 makes the design of S1 and S2 more uneconomical. Hence, S3 can be supported by radial bars of adequate diameters and anchored backwards in slab S4 through equal lengths. Another diagonal bar EF should be provided above the rear ends of a radial bars and it should be anchored in beams below top bars of supporting beams B1 and B2 to prevent lifting of radial bars. Next is layout of stairs. The type of stairs and its layout is governed by the available size of staircase room and the positions of beams and columns along the boundary of the staircase. The stair slabs are heavier as compared to the floor slabs. This is because of heavy load due to the inclined length of slab acting over horizontal span, additional weight of stairs and greater intensity of live loads on stairs. Stair flights shall be supported on beams or walls. Supporting the flight on landing slab should be avoided as it can cause the stress concentration in the supporting landing slabs at their junctions. Wherever possible, landing beams should be provided at the end of flight to reduce span. In the figure, beams can either be provided at AB or EF on one side and at GH or CD on the other side. Beams at EF and GH not only reduces the span but the landings beyond EF and GH acts as cantilevers, which significantly reduces the design movements at mid-span. When the provision of mid-landing beam, say at EF, is not possible due to non-availability of adequate headroom under the landing, then the flight may be supported on landing itself and the landing slab is made to span transversely across AE and BF on walls or on bracket beams taken out from the columns E and F. If span of stair is greater than 4.5 meters, then the flight may be supported on central stringer beam spanning across AB and CD and steps of the stair flight cantilevering out from the stringer beam on both sides. This arrangement is excellent for public buildings. Mm -hmm.